Wastelanders introduces a brand new foe to Appalachia, but even though it's new to West Virginia, it's one Fallout players may be familiar with. The Floater. All three of these bury themselves in the ground. They make a peculiar grumbling sound, so we know when we are getting close. <laughs> then we'll see sparkles, or bubbles or gas rising from the ground, green, blue, or orange depending on the floater that's buried there. And beneath the rising bubbles is a wriggling little worm. We can't target these in vats, but outside of vats we can still shoot the little worm if we shoot it. Or if we get too close, the floater rises from the ground and reveals himself. There are three primary types of floaters. First is the floater freezer. These are bright blue, and they shoot a freezing breath at us. When floaters die, they explode, dealing area of effect damage to anyone nearby. If we get tangled up in the death blast that comes from these blue floater freezers, they can actually drain our fusion cores, and they reduce our movement speed. So the blue ones are particularly nasty and need to be avoided by power armor users. Next is the floater Nasher. These are bright green and they are the melee floaters. They've got a vampire bite which deals damage and heals it. Upon death, the floater Nasher emits a big cloud of poison which deals poison damage over four seconds. And last there's the floater Flamer. These glow bright orange and they have two different attacks. One is a long-range fireball, and the other is a flamethrower for when we get too close. Upon death, these emit a huge inferno blast, dealing damage to anyone in the area. All three of these area effect death blasts linger around the floater corpse for some time before finally dissipating, so we need to wait a bit before looting the bodies. Floaters may be new to Appalachia, but they're not new to the Fallout universe. Even though chronologically this is our first time seeing them, the floater made an appearance in both Fallouts 1 and 2. There we find the floater hanging out with super mutants and centaurs as part of the Master's army. Now we already know from Fallout lore that the Master dipped people in big vats of FEV to turn them into super mutants. Even after the death of the Master, we can explain the floaters in Fallout 2 as being the remnants of the Master's army. But since the Master didn't exist yet in the timeline of Fallout 76, how then can we explain the floater? Our first bit of lore about the origin of the floater comes from Fallout 1. While exploring the glow, the original Vault Dweller can find a holotape in a wall locker on level 5 of the West Tech Research Facility. In that locker he finds the FEV Experiment Disc. Under Log Date May 9th, 2075, we infected several species of flatworm with FEV. Within hours, the worms had increased in size by 28%, and 39 separate viral contagions were resisted by the population. Each sample was allowed to continue for several generations, and the new DNA structure was successfully passed on to worms' progeny, although only a sexual reproduction was noticed in the samples. Experiments with insects have had less success. Major Barnett has postponed these experiments until further notice. So the scientists at West Tech in California had infected flatworms with FEV and even refined the process over several generations before the entire research experiment moved to the Mariposa military base before the bombs dropped in 2077. That means that the Mariposa military base, where the Master was born, and that the Master used to produce his super mutant army, had all of this pre-war research on infecting flatworms with FEV. And it is likely this very research that the Master used to create floaters. The floaters are flatworms infected with FEV. However, the floaters of Fallouts 1 and 2 look very different from floaters in Appalachia. Instead of actually floating, they appear to balance on a slithering tail they use to move about with. They have a sort of fleshy, pancake-shaped head with dangling little sacks. They've got this tendril-like tongue they use to attack with. 
And in fact, all of the body parts are named for us in vats. It has a head, mouth, a foremouth, a body, a float sac, the tail, the ganglion, and the ovipositor. If the floater from Fallout 1 and 2 is a fleshy snake tentacle creature, why does the floater from Fallout 76 look so different? Well, part of this can be explained by the float sacks we find attached to these West Coast floaters and by the description of a floater from the Fallout 2 official strategy guide. Floaters hover by manufacturing and storing noxious gases in their flotation bladders. They're stupid, but move fast and are very difficult to kill. Floaters will try to surround you, so keep your distance. The gases that allow them to float turn them into wonderful flambe when you crisp them with fire or energy weapons. This description of a floater from Fallout 2 doesn't really look like the floater we see in Fallout 2. In fact, the floaters from Fallout 76 better match this description. But if, as we are now to believe, the floater was in West Virginia, so close to the East Coast, why then was the floater missing on the East Coast during the events of Fallout 3 and Fallout 4? Well, it turns out that the floater was originally intended to be in Fallout 3. In The Art of Fallout 3, we find a number of concept art images of the floater which look like an interesting transition between the floaters of Fallout 1 and 2 and the floaters we eventually got in Fallout 76. They're fleshy. They've got these tentacle-like tails, but they also have the big bladder that allows them to float, like we read about in the Fallout 2 description, and like we see in Fallout 76. There was the Lamprey Floater, the Man of War Tendril Floater, and the Needle Tooth Floater. If the floater was a monster created by the Master, it makes sense then why it wouldn't exist in the Capital Wastelands, why we wouldn't find them in Fallout 3. But this doesn't explain why we don't find them in Fallout New Vegas. After all, Fallout New Vegas takes place in Nevada, not far from California, where Fallouts 1 and 2 took place. How can we explain this? Did they all die out? Well, one possible explanation comes from Joshua Sawyer, the director of Fallout New Vegas. In 2017, he was asked by a fan why floaters didn't appear in Fallout New Vegas, and he responded by saying that the floaters have really weirdly shaped bodies, and because they were so strangely shaped, this made them difficult and therefore expensive to animate. He ends by saying, we talked about having floaters, but we just didn't have the animation time for them. So floaters didn't make it into Fallout New Vegas, not because they weren't there on the West Coast during that time in the universe, but because they were too expensive to make. Perhaps the same is true for the Capital Wasteland. Perhaps there were floaters on the East Coast, but we didn't find them in the Capital Wasteland because they were too expensive to create. But if there were floaters on the East Coast, where did they come from? And how did they get to West Virginia? The Master hadn't made them yet by the time of the events of Fallout 76, and therefore any floaters we find in Appalachia probably didn't come from the West Coast. Well, we don't really know. It isn't explained during the lore of Fallout 76 Wastelanders, but the best explanation we do get comes from a random encounter. If we're lucky, and if we're sneaky, and we don't just start shooting, we have the potential to overhear a conversation. Look at that smile. I think it like you. I know it ugly, but it friend. It follow us here, but no attack. It need friend. What it say? I think it want to play. Or hungry. Maybe play with food like human? This is a conversation between two super mutant warlords observing a small pack of floaters near to their camp. The super mutants see the floaters as pets, and the mutants said that the floaters followed them there. Followed them from where? Well, from Huntersville. In my video on how super mutants came to Appalachia, we learned while exploring the West Tech Research Facility in Appalachia that West Tech researchers were experimenting with FEV, using it on the citizens of Huntersville, going so far as to poison the water of Huntersville. 
to see what would happen to the people. And when the people started to turn green and to grow, the scientists at West Tech, along with the military, went into town and apprehended everybody, imprisoning them inside the nearby West Tech research facility. We already know from the lore inside West Tech that at least one of their experiments in Huntersville escaped before the war. Could this be the origin of the floater? Maybe, but I don't think that makes sense. I think it was likely a human, a resident of the town that escaped the clutches of West Tech. I don't think we need anybody at West Tech to have been actively experimenting with flatworms to explain the existence of floaters in Appalachia. After all, they infected the water of Huntersville. And where do flatworms live? In water. They're found in freshwater ponds and lakes, like the lakes just outside Huntersville. The lakes West Tech infected with FEV. The lakes so infected with FEV that a super mutant behemoth is currently living in one. It's not a great leap to suggest that the flatworms living in these lakes also became infected with FEV. And since they reproduce asexually, hundreds of generations of FEV infected flatworms lived and died in the 26 or so years between the end of the world and the beginning of Wastelanders, giving the floater plenty of time to evolve and mutate until it, like its super mutant brethren, crawled from the waters of Huntersville as the dangerous floater and began to spread all over Appalachia, guarding and being guarded by their super mutant masters. We don't know what happened to the Appalachian floaters by the time of Fallout 3 and Fallout 4. Perhaps they all died out, or perhaps they never migrated that far east. But I think we can deduce that the Appalachian strain of floater evolved and mutated much in the same way as the West Coast floater. The major difference is, is that the West Coast floater was first part of an experiment run by human scientists and therefore its mutation and evolution was guided by hand. It was directed by man. The floater in Appalachia appears to have emerged naturally without being guided by any human hand. But those are just my thoughts based on the evidence that we find in the universe. What are your thoughts? Were you happy to see the floater return to a Fallout game? Do you like their new design? And do you find them as frustrating and challenging in combat as I do? They weren't much of a trouble in Fallouts 1 and 2, but man, in Fallout 76, these guys are nasty. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish new Fallout videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have, but you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxwan. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I've got a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. YouTube members and patrons on Patreon are becoming increasingly important as YouTube continues to make platform changes that make the future of YouTube monetization uncertain. So to all my YouTube members and my patrons on Patreon, you have my sincerest thanks. I couldn't do this without you. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.